electrical two test 13. We'll talk a little bit about gauges and sensors and that kind of thing. Uh, let's look at uh, electromagnetic, electromagnetic gauges. Do they use heat to produce needle movement? No. They use electromagnetism, don't they? They got a couple of coils laying in there at angles, and they got three terminals hooked to them. And whenever you power that gauge up with a power and ground, uh, it typically is going to go all the way one way or another. And when you ground the sensor leg of it, it's going to go the other way. So the more ground you apply through the sensor leg, the more the needle's going to move. Magnetic gauges, General Motors started to use them in the early 70s, you know. And they typically used to stay right where they were when you switched them off on those because they weren't spring-loaded or anything like that on the earlier cars. Nowadays, a lot of vehicles have got gauges that are actually driven by a uh, microprocessor in the instrument cluster. Anyway, equal pressure in the brake hydraulic system will cause the brake warning light to come on. Uh, it'd be unequal pressure in the brake hydraulic system, wouldn't it? Number three, it's normal for some electromagnetic gauges to remain at their last position when the ignition is turned off. That's true. I just said that a minute ago. Four, if equal voltage is applied to both sides of the lamp, the lamp remains off because current cannot flow. Is that true? Yes. Okay. That's number four. Everybody knows what I want. Let somebody else answer that one. The speedometer displays a speed based on electrical signal from an output speed it's sensor. That is it's it. Oh, excuse me. Well, no, wait a minute. I skipped five. Okay, on most vehicles, oil pressure gate changes are monitored by a piezo-resistive sensor. Yeah. If the speedometer displays, excuse me, the speedometer displays a speed based on electrical signal from the output speed sensor. That's sort of true. Uh, I will tell you that, um, like on some vehicles, the speed sensor will uh, send a signal to the anti-lock brake module and the anti-lock brake module then sorts it out and sends it up to the speedometer and the engine controller and other places. On well, some of them, uh, the engine controller, if I remember right, operates a, uh, sends a signal to the speedometer and so it doesn't always, the output speed sensor doesn't always directly run the speedometer. Sometimes you have a module in between is basically what I'm saying there. Federal and state laws pro prohibit changing the correct mileage of the odometer. Sure. Now, years ago, when we were uh, when I was working at the Ford dealership, what we used to do when we put a speedometer on there, we would take the drum out of the original speedometer and we would put it in the speedometer we were changing. That wasn't really a factory procedure. The shop foreman and I got in a little uh, contest talking about that. He said, well, let's just look that up in the book and what it says. Uh, see what it says. So we looked up in the, in the Ford book and the Ford book says, uh, there is no shop manual procedure for changing the mileage on a million mile odometer. However, federal law prohibits you to put a car out with fewer miles on it than what it came in with. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So basically, they're going to tell you, you need to, you need to do this, but we're not going to tell you how it happens. Now, the newer speedometers, you got, you're supposed to actually tell the, uh, report the mileage to the dealership. And the dealer, and you're supposed to down the vehicle before there, nobody's driving it. And the dealership is supposed to uh, get the mileage that you gave it that was on the truck, put in the odometer, and then when you put it back in there, it's got the same miles. Well, I was, me and the shop foreman was going on about it. He said, well, they send a sticker in there you can put on the door, you know, that says that this odometer, this speedometer was replaced with this many miles. And uh, I said, well, what if they peel the sticker off? You know, the customer's able to peel a sticker off. Who's, in, who's, who's, on, who's on the line then? Because we can't prove we put a sticker on there. You know, of course, he got all huffy about that because he didn't have an answer for me. And so uh, then uh, this, but have, have you ever seen one, a, an odometer that had red numbers on the end of the, mm -hmm. that means it's been replaced. Yeah. yeah, if you see one that's got red numbers on it. And so one day, the, my compadre over there, he popped a dollar head in the Explorer, uh, you know, and, and he as soon as the guy picked it up, he drove it straight over to the used car department. And he goes, what's those red numbers on the end of that odometer going to do to my trade-in value? And the guy in the used car department says, it's going to knock it 25%. You're going to lose 25% on your trade-in value because of that red number. So he pulled it back in the right up there. He said, I don't want this red number on here. What do you think about that? You know, because the speedometer had been replaced because of the noise it was making or something. So they go back to the guy that's over here next to me, and he goes, I've already done everything I was supposed to do. I'm not going to do all this free work again to pull that all back apart. Blah, 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 blah. You know, so they after he bit their head off and you know shouted them down. Uh, they said, "Can you help us with this?" And I said, "Yeah, I'll help you with it." <laughs> so I pulled the speedometer out and I got the speedometer. He had pulled out and I got the drum. It had the right miles on it. Put it in there. 
the guy had his black numbers, he had the right miles, everything was fine, so he didn't break any laws. Um, it's a little more difficult to do that now with the electronic speedometers and also you just about got them to make the, when you, and sometimes they, I think it's illegal for the dealership to sell a speedometer to an individual. You know, just because of the because they can change it. because of the no because of the you're actually if you put a speedometer on there that's got fewer miles than the vehicle's got on it, you can act like that's the original mileage. So and you misrepresent it and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so anyway, that's a kind of a dicey issue and all that. But uh, uh, technically, if you can actually prove that you put a sticker on there that you know like what came with the speedometer saying, you know, take a picture of it, put it with a file, this is the speedometer as it was, and this is the vehicle, this is the serial number, blah, blah, blah. I'd put it right there by the serial number plate and all that, and if anybody peeled it off. Of course, they're not likely to. You know, most customers aren't that slick. Uh, before replacing the fuel gauge sender unit, clean the ground connections and test for proper operation. That's true, uh, basically. Uh, I was going to talk just for a minute about that fuel gauge sending unit on that uh, little Dodge Dakota. Uh, that boy said that the fuel gauge sending unit was not, I mean, the fuel gauge wasn't working at all. And so what we had here was we had a ground, and what we had here was we had a, this is going to look like a plain old pot. And this was E, and that was F. This is in the tank now. Got me? And this wiper, you know, see that ground? See that? All right, and so there was two wires <laughs> right there. So basically, I'm going to have to do this this way. There was two wires, and they were going to the, the cluster. And so this thing obviously was hooked to a wiper. That's strange, isn't it? That's not the way they're ordinarily built, is it? That's just really odd. It was like a 94 Dodge Dakota. The wiper was hooked to the ground? It actually goes, yeah, it's hooked to the ground, and it goes up and down. And as it goes up and down, you know, I says, okay, think about it. I says, whenever the ground is closest to this position, your gauge reads full. When it's closest to that position, your gauge reads empty. And he was talking about what was going on the other end. I said, no matter what's going on the other end, we know how it worked. And the gauge is always laying on empty. I said, let's go ahead and hook this, hook a little uh, probe to this, and connect it to ground. All right, got that? So we hooked it, connect that, turn it to ground, turn on the key. Went to full. See, that means you got a bad sending unit. <laughs> Didn't take hardly no time to do it. See, we actually, the wire was coming, you know, it was in a loom, you know, we found the appropriate color wire, the one we knew it was, right by the gas tank. We just used a little, you know, a little prick probe that I used that bites into the wire. You know, get the ground, that's how we checked that one there. But, you know, what I was telling you on the, on the Fords and on most of the, uh, the Chevy stuff, if you unplug the sending unit, it goes past full. If you ground the sending unit wire, it goes past empty. So, you know, anyway, you'll, you'll have to fix one of those before you leave here. Uh, technician A says, in most electromagnetic gauges, if the sending unit resistance is low, the gauge will read low. Technician B says, in most bimetallic gauges, if the sending unit resistance is low, the gauge will read high. Resistance uh, being low meaning like it's shorted to ground, right? That's C, basically. However, this guy is not talking the right kind of smack here. Uh, coolant temperature gauges work different from gas gauges. If you ground the sending unit going to a gas gauge, and I'm not, I'm not talking about these oddball things like I just showed you. If you ground the sending unit going to a gas gauge, it goes to empty. If you ground the sending unit going to a temperature gauge, it goes to full. You got me? You better be aware of those, you know, which way they go. So I want to know, you know, if a lot of times in your schematic, it'll say, it'll say 22 ohms empty, uh, 145 ohms full. You got me? And so when they make a gauge tester, you could build you on a little pot like I was talking about. You take a little potentiometer, if you get one with the right kind of resistance, and you mark the places on your little tool you've built, you know the little box I got with the knob and the pot inside it, you mark the place where different ohm readings are, and you can basically turn it to the ohm reading that you've marked it on your box and see if the gauge corresponds. Halfway between 22 and 145 is how much? We got 85 ohms, isn't it? Something like that. Because, uh, I mean, look at the difference. 22 and 145, it's a, uh, 123 ohms. You're going to split that. It's going to be like 62. You're going to add that to 22, so it's going to come out to be at 85. So if you turn it to 85 ohms, you should really have a tank. If 22 is empty and 145 is full, but you don't know until you look in your book what the gauge resistance is. Some of your electronics worksheets talk about that. 
trying to find out what that resistance is. And the reason it's significant is because if you have to troubleshoot a gauge, you need to know so you can define, you know, what's going on there. And it's not always the same part. It'd be really nice. I was talking to one of the parts men one day, and he was always crabbing because every time I went in there, I had something that was hard to look up. You know what I mean? And I said, you know, how much do you think you would get paid if all of the parts uh, boxes had like either one of three numbers on them, A, B, or C? And you come in there and said, I want part B, and all you had to do is take a white box and put it on the counter. You know, just shut up and do your job. You're supposed to look up the parts and give me what I need here. And stop whining because it's hard to look up. I mean, that's why they pay you as much as they do because you're having to dig. Well, in those days, we had microfish. We didn't have computers. <laughs> you know, dragging that little thing around and reading a, a little bitty film about this big. They had all the whole parts catalog on it. It was it magnified on a big screen, you know. And you just had to move it a little bit. But anyway, those guys would complain because they had to go here, there, and yonder, and all that. And the numbers would find out that. And if you couldn't get them to give you the part number. Technician A says needle movement of three coil gauges is a result of the interaction of three electromagnets and the total field effect on a permanent magnet. Technician B says the interaction of a permanent magnet and an electromagnet and the total field effect causes needle movement in the D or sylvanol gauge. <laughs> now, if you read your book, you would know, wouldn't you? Lundy would know if he was here. Wouldn't he? That's a C, actually. Uh, fuel gauge. You know, some of these questions are so uh, clogged up with words that it makes you wonder how am I ever going to use that to fix a car. The fuel gauge of digital instrument cluster is missing two segments of its numerical display. Technician A says the cluster has excessive ground circuit resistance. Technician B says the cluster needs to be replaced. That's not complicated, is it? Yeah. You're not going to be able to fix it with a ground if it's just got two segments that have gone dark. Uh, technician A says depending on the manufacturer, a new IC chip may be programmed to display the last odometer reading. Technician B says some manufacturers provide for the replacement of the IC chip if it fails. That's C, basically. Technician A says a conventional analog instrumentation is more accurate than digital instrumentation. Technician B says digital instrumentation displays an average of the readings received from the sensor. And that's B, actually. Um, the old analog speedometers that used to have on the Tauruses uh, would get to where they were making, they'd make a noise and the needle would bounce all over the place. And uh, Basically, they had a, uh, the speedometer cable would spin a drum and that drum had a, uh, the way it was built, the speedometer cable, you know, was a cable inside a sheath, you know, that came up here, you know, it was running inside a tube, and it would hook into this little thing that would go in here, and, you know, you'd, of course, you had it, it would snap onto this cluster, all right, and on up here in the speedometer, you'd have a drum, a metal drum like this, with this thing spinning, and I'm not drawing it perfectly, but uh, basically, it would spin that, uh, and... It had a piece of metal in there, and right in the middle of that thing was a hole, a little hole with a bronze bushing in it, and the, the needle the needle would be out here, and it would sit in that hole if you blew, if you blew that up, it would sit in that hole like that. Now that was right here. Okay, so what would happen is there is a little spiral spring that was hooked to this that would hold it back towards zero. And as this, and on this, uh, mounted on this uh, speedometer needle was a magnet. And as that drum would spin faster and faster, that magnet would try to follow it. But it was having to work against that spiral spring. Well, in the base of this thing was sitting in that little spinning drum. And as this little son of a gun here, you know, would get a little wear, and some of these little particles of copper would fall in there. And this was a tiny little thing. It was as little as a straight pin. You know, it would fall in there, and it would start grabbing that needle shaft, and that needle would go, wow, 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 wow. And a speedometer for one of those cars was $500. It was real expensive. I mean, by the time you did the labor. Thing. And so I got to thinking about that. I took some of those things apart, and I said, I think I'm going to investigate this. And uh, I figured out what was going on with them, because, you know, that, and I would blow that out, clean it up real good, and it's sitting in there at kind of an angle anyway, about like that. And I would put a... Uh, one single drop of oil, a tiny little drop of oil, like with a hypodermic needle, right in here. And so for the rest of that speedometer's life, believe it or not, that silly little thing was swimming in oil, and it never messed up again. And I fixed, I don't know how many of them for $25. But there were some tricks you had to know. When you pull the, the speedometer face, basically had your, your post here, right? And then here's your 10, your 20, your 30, and here's your needle resting against that post, right? Needle's against the post. You understand what I'm drawing here? All right. I noticed there was a mark right here. 
they had really no reason to be there except I found out that see if you to get that needle off that shaft so you can do what I'm talking about you actually I have a little tool a little screwdriver tool that I had made for something else it was forked kind of like our trim tool but smaller but I made it you know I bent it a little bit and I made a little notch in the end of it and I'd be put me a rag on this instrument and I'd put it under that thing and I'd pry a little bit and that needle would pop off of that shaft just pop off and I'd have it in my hand well, how are you going to know it's on there right when you put it back? Is it going to point in the wrong place? You see what I'm saying? So what I did was, I would let everything get relaxed, and I would put it on there, put that needle on that shaft, pointing at that little thing right there. Got it? And after I tapped that needle back on the shaft real gentle, then I would pick that needle up and raise it over that post and let it rest get the post. And when I did that, it was always accurate. <laughs> I just kind of figured that out. There wasn't any... Uh, uh, you know, when we were taking it apart and put the drums in there, you know, we would have to do this kind of stuff too. Or sometimes, you know, we, that's how I got to look at it all that. We didn't have to pop the needle off to do that, but we did when we were fixing that other stuff. Uh, I used to figure that I might teach y'all how to do that in here, but then I thought, you know, most of those things are gone anyway. They're all gone electronic, you know. So it's like telling somebody, teaching somebody to work on carburetors, you know. What good is that anymore? Of course, Matt's working over there at Donnie's place, and Donnie said all oh, last week they were working on carburetors. <laughs> And so Donnie knows carburetors enough where we can teach you about that. I ain't got time for that in here. All right, let me see. Um, what number are we on? Fourteen. Fourteen. Technician A says the tachometer is used to measure drive shaft speed. Pardon me? Technician B says the tachometer receives its signal from the plus side of the ignition coil. Mm -hmm. Both of those guys are yo-yos. The only ignition coil that I know is switched on the positive side is that MSD ignition. You know, like the race car ignition. Those are switched on the hot side. But every other ignition I've ever seen, the, the negative side switch is what makes us spark. Technician A says if all gauges are not operating, check the fuse. Technician B says only one gauge will be affected if the instrument cluster ground is open. Wow, I'd say on the old bimetal gauges, it basically had a little wire wrapped around a bimetal strip, and when that wire heated up, that bimetal strip would change shape and it would move that needle. Uh, if you had a bad ground going to that instrument cluster, when you turn on the key, it would, uh, it, the <coughs> instrument voltage regulator would move out. It wouldn't let the smoke out of every one of those gauges. I had a Jeep, uh, an 83 uh, Jeep J10 pickup, or it might have been a Grand, Grand Cherokee, or Grand Wagoneer. Big old thing, you know, big old thing is 10 miles to the gallon. Uh, and then whenever I, I had the cluster un, out, out of the dash, holding it in my hand, and when I turned on the key, whenever you took the cluster out, it was ungrounded. And you turn the key on, every gauge in that thing went all the way to hot, and the smoke went out of it. So I had to put a whole set of gauges in the darn thing. Well, see, there's nothing in the book about that. You just had to find it out. You know, you you know, burn, learn, and learn. Hey, girl, come on in here. You have some parts for me? Respiration fluid, filter, and dipstick. I am not a dipstick. All right, there you go. That is a dipstick tool. It's like eighty dollars to check yeah. the dipstick and those uh, checking the transmission fluid in those vehicles that ain't gotten them. Looks like Zach's printing some stuff over there. Okay, uh, charger. All right, there's that one. And this right here is a Chrysler slash Volkswagen dipstick. You know that transmission is a Mercedes transmission, right? Really? It is. Look at the top of it. Yeah, it's got a little vent on it. It's got a Mercedes symbol on it. Uh, supply on that one. I hope he did. I hope he put it on supply and not is that right, Pio? Yeah, it is. You know what to do with those. All right. Thank you. Let's plow through, guys. We're a little bit in here. Um, technician A says air core electronic air electromagnetic gauges and quartz swing needle displays are similar. My goodness, what names we got here. Technician B says in quartz needle displays, the A coil is connected to the system voltage and the B coil receives a voltage proportional to input frequency. What you got there? That's a C, actually. Uh, have you ever seen those cool-looking instrument clusters where the uh, they've got a mirror uh, there and the, um, the, the numbers are backwards down here and they're reflected behind the needles? And the needles look like they're floating in space. You know, it's a strange-looking instrument cluster. And I think some of the Lincolns have that. Well, that uh, anybody's ever started that Lexus up there? It's got a kind of a cool instrument cluster out there. You know, it's interesting looking. 
Okay, um, that's the first thing you see when you sit down in the car. Then. The first thing you see when you sit down in the seat, you look at the instrument cluster. And if you like what you see, that's a good thing if you're, if you're somebody that's into stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, of course, me, I like to have one that's just got the speedometer needle and a couple of gauges, you know what I mean? It's okay, you know. Um, Technician A says, uh, if the speedometer is not operating and the body control module and or cluster module passes a self-test, the fault may be in the vehicle speed sensor circuit. Technician B says, if the speedometer works but the odometer does not, the vehicle speed sensor is likely the problem. That's A. Now think about it. If the odometer doesn't work but the speedometer does, what do we know? Exactly, we know that, but what do we know? We know that we're getting a speed signal, right? It has to be a bad instrument, I mean a speedometer head. It has to be. You know two ways about it. Or, other way, what if the odometer works but the speedometer don't read? You're getting a signal. It's got to be the head. You know, I mean if you just reason that thing out, you don't have to do any troubleshooting. You know, if it's, I mean if it's, if it's actually responding to the speed. Now, what about what if my speedometer? What if my speedometer is inaccurate? You know, we talked a little bit about that before. You can use your GPS, but that's not always perfectly accurate either. Seems like it would be, but it's not. I mean, GPS units are, are really uh, the GPS satellite system is really accurate because of the cesium clocks they use and all that kind of stuff. You know, the same as the atomic clocks that we got. But at the same time, you can have if you ever drive down the road, you can have three different GPS units in your car, and they'll be reading three different speeds. You ever done that? Most of you have never had more than one GPS in your car. Have you? you know, but I mean, I just happened to be in the car one day. Uh, this guy that was all gung ho about a GPS, and I happened to have GPS in my car, and somebody has that on their phone. You can actually get within two or three miles an hour difference on each one of them. So it's not always perfectly accurate. GPS ain't really direct. I like to go 60 miles an hour and see if it's one minute from mile marker to mile marker if I can find a place to do that. Holding it at 60 miles an hour, it should be one minute from one mile marker to the next. That way you know if the mile markers are accurate and you're, driving, you're holding it at a steady 60 miles an hour, you ought to see 60 seconds go by between mile markers. What if I pass a mile marker and only 55 seconds have gone by? But I was reading too fast, right? Well, we used to have to do this all the time, guys. I mean, somebody kind of, my speedometer is inaccurate. Well, your scan tool ain't going to help you with that, is it? You know what I mean? You better come up with some kind of way to make this work. However, whenever you drive it, you know, you can actually go in here and change the tire size and the axle ratio and all that on your scan tool to recalibrate it. You know, you can check and see. I've actually had a pickup truck somebody brought in there one time, and they said, the speedometer is wrong on this thing. And so I drove it and, you know, did the old-fashioned mile marker to mile marker. I was like, yeah, this is terribly wrong. And this put 10, 15 miles an hour off. And then I found out somebody at another dealership had been scratching around trying to fix it and really didn't know what they were doing. And they swapped the engine controller from another similar truck, but it had a different axle ratio and different tires on it. And so they didn't put all, they didn't fix all that. They just popped the, instru you know, the inter engine controller in it and swept it out the door. And now the guy's driving around getting traffic tickets because his speedometer's wrong. You see, and that's a, you know, he can actually, sometimes as police will, if you can prove your speedometer is wrong, the cops will, you know, soften up on the ticket a little bit, unless they're trying to be hard about, hard on you. Uh, all right, anyway, uh, I've actually had one guy that got a ticket, and he said his speedometer was wrong, he thought, and I took it and drove it down the road and checked his speedometer. I said, your speedometer is accurate, you didn't pay your ticket. <laughs> it was, I mean, he was with me. You know, he sat there, I said, this is how we're going to do this, watch this, we're going to see if it's right, you know. All right, um. Let me see. Uh, technician A says the ground in the circuit between the indicator light and the pressure switch could cause the oil pressure light to stay on when the engine's running. Is that right? You like that answer? Technician B says an open in the pressure switch could cause the oil pressure light to stay on. Yeah, A is A only on that. Now on these Ford pickup trucks and stuff, and some of these cars, they got a, the pressure switch closes its contacts whenever you got oil pressure and opens the contacts when you don't. You need to be aware of that. And they didn't use potentiometer, you know, transducer-style oil pressure sending units. Starting in 1987, they got away from the magnetic gauges on the pickup trucks and then went to uh, the, uh, excuse me, bimetal gauges went away in 96 on pickups, so they put magnetic gauges on there. But those magnetic gauges didn't like the, the potentiometer they were using for the uh, oil pressure. 
And so they actually says, they told us to take this other oil pressure switch, take that big fat transducer off, put an oil pressure switch on there that would have contact when you had oil pressure, which is backwards of what you think it would be. Then we put a 22 ohm resistor in between that and this wire harness so that any time you had oil pressure, it would come up in the middle. It just stay in the middle, see? So that's not a true oil pressure gauge. It would tell you if you didn't have oil pressure, but the contacts in that switch will get bad, and it will actually make you think you've got an oil pressure problem when you don't. On those, the reason I'm telling you this is this question was acting like it's always this way, but on those, if you're uh, if you got dirty contacts and your gauge went down low, the instrument cluster would turn on the oil light. If the gauge would be low, you turn on the oil light, and that's when you're supposed to pull it out. You know, put your uh, you can just throw a sensor in there, a sending unit in there, right quick and see what that does. But you need to go ahead and do the master gauge test to see if you've got oil pressure. Technician A says the thermi thermistor sensor measures pressure. Does it? What's the thermistor measure? Temp. Technician B says a voltmeter is used to test a thermistor sensor unit. Who's correct on that? That's a B. Uh, a vehicle's electronic digital fuel gauge is always indicating the full tank. All the other instrument gauges are operating correctly. Which of the following is the most likely to be the cause of this problem? A, excessive resistance in the cluster power supply circuit. B, faulty cluster ground circuit. C, shorted fuel gauge cinder unit. D, high resistance in the fuel gauge cinder unit. Well, I'll think about it now. Full tank. What did I tell you? When you, unplug, when you unplug the sending unit and switch on the key, where does that needle go? Typically. Nope, it goes the other way. It goes full. You short it to ground, it goes to empty. Uh, okay. That's on a, now, it's the other way on a temperature gauge, but on the fuel gauge, it's this way. Okay. All right. So, you know what my old rule of thumb is, and I never heard anybody else teach this, the part that's in the most hostile environment and working the hardest is the part that usually fails. That's usually where I focus my diagnosis unless it's really, really hard to get to, you know. So what's in the most hostile environment in your fuel gauge indicator system? The doggone sending unit is sloshing around in that tank with all that gasoline and everything in it. And it's always moving up and down. Your needle doesn't do this. It used to. Back in the olden days, if you were driving a 72 model 442 Oldsmobile that had a half a tank of gas in it, and you punched it to pass a car, the needle would go click all the way to empty because the gas sloshed the back of the tank. Then, yeah, it just moves all over the place. Yeah. Now they actually got away from that by putting what they call a slosh module in there, and this is a this is a slosh module out of a Ford instrument cluster. And if you look at the way the uh, printed circuit is done, they have the printed circuit where it could go straight to the gauge, but it's clipped and it goes through this on the way to the gauge. And this right here keeps it from responding too quickly. So if you're troubleshooting one of these vehicles that's got a slow responding needle for slosh purposes. What you can do is uh, switch off the vehicle, change your resistance, turn it back on because it will correct more quickly when you first turn it back on. How many of you have ever filled your car up with gas and you knew it was full of gas but it was only reading three quarters of a tank? You know, I mean sometimes that kind of garbage would happen on my Jeep. It didn't happen every time. Sometimes it happened and I knew it wasn't because I didn't fill it up. It was an anomaly in the uh, instrument cluster computer. Um, a vehicle, let me see, technician A says, a normally open switch is used in most coolant temperature warning light circuits. Technician B says most oil pressure warning light circuits normally use a closed switch. C. All right. Let me see. Uh, which of the following is not true about a quartz analog speedometer system? A. The signal from the PM generator is a DC frequency. Mm. What is PM? Is that a, a sensor that's only nighttime or something? Or what? Come on, somebody come up with an answer for that. You guys don't play, don't play dumb with me. What? What's his name? Paul Molive? No, what? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Well, primary module? Oh, that's spirit. What do you think, Daniel? Daniel has already pretty much got a college degree before he even came here. He should be able to figure this out, right? What do you think, Daniel? Try permanent magnet. <laughs> okay, PM. Sometimes you just, you know, can't pull it up. Uh, not a big deal. Okay, um, the signal from the vehicle speed sensor is modified by the VSS buffer. The signal uses an AD converter. Uh, the signal from the speed sensor is AC voltage. Okay, every one of those except A is correct. 
The signal from the pole on the permanent magnet generator, I almost said the wrong words there, is a DC is not a DC frequency. Number 23, what usually controls an oil pressure warning lamp? B, a ground switch. Technician A says when testing a system using an IVR, in other words, if your system has an instrument voltage regulator, which is what an IVR is, use a voltmeter to test for regulated voltage at a common point. Technician B says if regulated voltage is within specs, replace the printed circuit board. Who's right about that? A is right about that. But here's what you do. Uh, let's say that you got one that's an older vehicle, you know, with an instrument voltage regulator in there because it's got bimetal gauges. And uh, you got to look and see, you know, in your schematic what it is. If you hook your test light to ground and you unplug that sensor and you touch your test light tip to that sensor and that light's blinking, real gentle blink, you got an instrument voltage regulator, right? Something else I tell you. If I'm looking for any gauge, if I'm looking at any gauge and I'm trying to see if that gauge is going to work right, I mean, if, what the problem is with the gauge, if I have my test light to the ground and I very gently touch that sending unit wire and it lights up with a dim glow and the gauge responds, I know my wires are good. I know I probably got a best sending unit. It's fairly simple to do that. Really. You got me? Everybody clear what I'm talking about here? What about you, Mr. Tap Out? You clear? Hook your gauge to the sending I mean, hook your test light to the sending unit wire to see where it goes. You know? Some of them actually, the scan tool shares that. You know? So that you can actually watch your scan tool reading while you do that too. If I touch my gate, if I touch the tip of my test light that's in the unit wire and it doesn't respond, I know I may have an open circuit. You see, but if the light comes on real dim, which a lot of times it'll do, coming through that little magnet in the, uh, I mean, the magnetic field in there, you know, like a, a high impedance test light with one that don't pull in hardly any amps. You know, if it lights up, you know, you know you typically have got a good wire going all the way in there. You know, you can actually do some tests if you're smart. You can figure out a heck of a lot just from one test, like Daniel. Remember when I showed you the cruise control? How many tests we did with that one wire? You know? And so, all right, let me see. Uh, which of the following is not contained in, th in a three coil gauge? A bucking coil, a high reading coil, a low reading coil, or a non reading coil? <laughs> That's D. There's no non reading coil in there. What in the world good would that be? Technician, are computer driven quartz needles uh, displays are similar in design to the air core electromagnetic gauges used in what type of instrument panels? That's conventional. Analog instrument panels. What's the four types of electromagnetic gauges? D. Arsenival, three coil, two coil, and air core. Those are there. I mean, so like I say, you're not gonna um, you're not gonna fix a lot of cars with that information. I mean, just that's just me talking, you know. So don't you know? Don't, yeah, the one if you're having trouble. You don't have trouble spelling the Arsenival. Aren't you? The Arsenival. Arson, like think about the fire, somebody starts fires with VAL on the end of it and a D and an apostrophe before that. Three coil, two coil, and air coil. Okay. Y'all would really like to have a bunch of essay questions on your panels, wouldn't you? That'd be good. All right then. Uh, number 30. Wait a minute. I got digital instrument clusters. You watch type of displays to notify the driver of monitored system conditions. Come on, this ain't hard. Digital and linear displays. Uh, a digital display is going to have numbers, and a linear display will have a little bar graph. What is the most common type of fuel level sending unit? What would you call it? Anybody know? How would you describe it? Huh? No, it's not going to be electromagnetic. You're talking about the actual sending unit. We got our fuel level sender. Can you describe what, how it works? Hey. What were you talking about a while ago with the graphite? Variable resistor. Ver variable resistor? Imagine that thought. Okay, it's a mechanical variable resistor. Float, it's hooked to that. You remember whenever uh, uh, Daniel uh, G was here, he had this uh, Ford pickup truck and he kept getting sending units that had the little brass floats in them and they would leak gas into that float and the float would sink <laughs> and his gauge wouldn't read. You can take it out and you get that little little brass thing and shake it and it'd have gas in it, you know. But the little brass uh, carburetor floats used to do that too. The float would get gas in it and it would sink. And even the little black foamy ones would do that. They'd soak up gas and sink and make it flood. Okay, what's the purpose of the tachometer? Engine speed, that's right. My buddy Alan, uh, when I was a boy, he had a 65 
uh, Impala SS, a yellow one, and it was a sort of a build out via a sort of a hot rod, you know. And over on the right side of that long dash, it, you know, you know, had little round things on either end of that. One of them, it had a factory vacuum gauge. And it would just, that needle would just move all over the place when he was driving. It would just move everywhere. Of course, it, the, the true purpose of that, it'd have, you know, uh, red, yellow, green, and all that sort of stuff. And he would actually have it, uh, if you kept it in the green most of the time while you are driving, it'd help you with gas mileage. Well, I asked my dad one day, I says, what is a vacuum gauge good for on a car? Because I didn't know, you know, I mean, this is, you know, this is a 65 model car, you know, and this is probably in about 1968, you know. And uh, I wasn't even driving yet, I mean, not legally. But my dad says, that's something you look at while you're having an accident. <laughs> if you're watching it, you crash. <laughs> you need to be careful not to do that, you know. There was another car that this guy named Jerry Whitehead drove. It was an Oldsmobile. And it was an early 60s Oldsmobile of some vintage, you know, Super 88 it said on the side. I guess it was an 88 Oldsmobile. And it had a, it had a bar that would go across with a speedometer. And when it started out green, and when you hit... 75 miles an hour, it would turn yellow. I mean, it would actually change colors. I don't know how they do that. And when you hit 85 miles an hour, it would turn red. <laughs> and I got in there with him one day, right down there in Level Plains between the, you know, Charles Waters' house and the store. And uh, he had a big old chew of tobacco in his mouth. And I was about probably 13. And he looked over and he goes, watch it turn red. <laughs> And he got that car up to 90 miles an hour before he got to the store just so he could watch that speedometer turn red. And I think that they stopped doing that because people always wanted to watch it turn red and it kept going faster. <laughs> they needed to just because they wanted to see the speedometer change colors. But I, I think it was like a 63. It was, I know it was an Oldsmobile. And I know it was a Delta 88, but called it a Super 88. I don't know if anybody from me remembers that, but I remember him saying, What'd you turn red? <laughs> and he just punched that thing. And I could have got us all killed. Okay, uh... What is a piezo-resistive sensor used to monitor? More pressure. No. Pressure changes. Uh, you're not necessarily wrong. You're not. You know, as the fuel level. Well, pressure changes. You know, whenever. What happens when you squeeze uh, quartz? If I squeeze quartz, what happens? I make voltage. I squeeze quartz. I make voltage. You know the little lighters that you snap. You know, you snap the lighter, you know, that's got a little pressure thing in it. It's got some quartz in it, from what I understand. Snap. It's not a little thing you take out and shock people. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the thing you take out and shock people with. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I found out, you know, it's not really a good idea to do that because some people don't like it. Uh, as the fuel level decreases in most vehicles equipped with a digital fuel gauge, what will happen to the fuel sender resistance? In other words, you uh, the fuel resistance on most of them will decrease. What I tell you, it's going to have, uh, if you short it, it goes to empty. If it's open, it goes to full, right? So higher resistance is full, lower resistance is empty, usually. All gauges require what type, the use of what type of sending unit? What type? What you need? Um, where's the seal puller at? Uh, hanging up there behind one of those hammers on the tool board. Yes, it is. Yeah. On the tool board, hanging behind a hammer. Um, all right. So this is really a scary question to me. All gauges require the use of what type of sending unit? What was I? What kind of gauge was I talking about a minute ago? A vacuum gauge. How does? What does it require? A daggum hose. That's all it requires. Ain't right? So basically, you're, if, if you're going to get this one right, you're going to have a variable resistive. It's going to change resistance with temperature or position or whatever, or pressure. What type of display system displays visual images on the inside of the windshield in the driver's field of vision? What do you call that? Heads up display. Mm -hmm. Heads up display. Like on a fighter jet. Um, what type of... Sim huh? Well, they're not. GM did it for a while. That's not all that common. What type of symbols are used to represent the gauge function on electronic instrument uh, panels? Ah, that's a good question. You know, when you're looking at the, your, uh, like in this girl's trailblazer right here, when you're looking at the uh, the different positions on the uh, air conditioner where the air is going to blow out, you know, it's got somebody sitting in a seat and it's got a 
arrow pointed at her face or an arrow pointed at the floor in your face or an arrow pointed at the windshield and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got your check engine symbol. Always looks the same, doesn't it? Pretty much. I mean, on a newer car. And then you got some other little symbols. You got a little, uh, looks like a little thermometer with water in it. You seen those little symbols I'm talking about? That's International Standards Organization. Doesn't matter what language you speak, it's an ISO symbol. You can sit down in there and you can figure out what those gauges mean and what the, you know, you don't, you can just look at it and tell. So you don't have to actually be able to read the words. You got me? That's what I, that's my idea about it. That's why they do that. So no matter what country you're from or wherever you put it, wherever you market this car anywhere in the world, they can look at it. Look at a picture of a gas pump, you know, for the gas gauge. You know, they don't used to, they used to have, you know, fuel or whatever. Now they've gone away from all that and everything. Things change every day, so. What are the four types of digital displays? The four types of digital displays. How about light emitting diodes? That's LED. Liquid crystal. Vacuum fluorescent. And cathode ray tube. What is a cathode ray tube? Anybody know? Like a little TV, like a little TV screen, isn't it? Like a little. All right. What about vacuum fluorescent? You know what those look like? The vacuum. You've seen them. You just didn't know it's what they were. The vacuum fluorescent display is basically almost looks like LED, but it's different uh, in that it's sort of dark and it'll usually be green. The numbers will be light up in green. Okay. Liquid crystal display can either have you know, it's kind of like some of your liquid crystal watches. You know, they'll either have black numbers or they'll have numbers that are, um, will let the light through. And, uh, you know, I saw a Thunderbird uh, one time whenever they had this um, liquid crystal display so that everything was dark except where the numbers were and they would let light through. You know how they work? They got polarity. Have you ever took a, put up a piece of polarized glass and put them like this? You can see through them just perfectly clear and you turn them this way they get totally black. You can't see through them. That's how black. That's how vacuum fluorescent. If you got some old sunglasses that are polarized, and you break them in two, and you hold those sunglasses up like this, and I mean those two lenses, and you turn them, if you get them to where those, they're only letting one wavelength of light through, you see. And if you turn them so that the the wavelengths are running counter to each other, it's totally black. You can't see nothing. But when you turn it like that, you can see. See, you got me. That was something, believe it or not, I learned that in, a, in a middle school, in seventh grade. The science teacher had two pieces of polarized glass, and she says, look, that's perfectly clear. And then when she turned it, they went totally black. And I was like, ooh, wow, ooh, that's cool. You know, but that's, maybe that's uh, if you, I mean, once you get that burned in, if you've seen it work, it is, there's a lot of stuff you understand just by, de by default. You know, ping, it just comes to you. As a matter of fact, somewhere down here, I've got a book, if you're interested in thumbing through it, that talks about electronic clusters and stuff somewhere. Anyway, that's cool stuff. I don't know where it is right now. All right, so what's the purpose of the instrument voltage regulator? you got to have a constant voltage to the gauge regardless of the voltage output of the charging system. What else needs that? What about the engine controller? It's got to have 5 volts. Just solid 5 volts. Even if the charging system voltage can swing from what to what? You can get you can go from below 11 volts all the way up to 14 and a half, 15 volts, and you don't want uh, everything to operate crazy when all that's going on. You know when your voltage is high versus low, you know because uh, that's you got to be able to you know, regulate that. The speedometer, odometer, and the oil and the fuel gauge temperature gauges are what? That's the most commonly used computer-driven instruments: speedometer, odometer, oil, fuel, voltage, and temperature gauges. Well, that's about all the instruments you got, isn't that pretty much? Duh. Explain how and what to test when all the gauges fail to operate. Okay, here's an essay question. You ready? Everybody ready for that? What would you do? What's the first thing you're going to do when anything doesn't work? Check. Electric Electrical stuff don't work. What are you going to do? Check. Fuse is smart. That's a smart thing to do. Why don't we check the easy stuff first, okay? Let's look at the... Uh, Voltage at the last common circuit point. And we're going to follow that from the fuse to whatever it all, all of this stuff's not working. You're going to go, go to the place where all of those, uh, where that branches out and goes to all of them. And I'm going to see if i got voltage right there. If i got voltage there, then one of those legs is going to dark on me, basically is what that amounts to. 
If there's no voltage at that point, you're going to work backwards on that. But anyway, number 40, list the three types of sending units and define their purposes. Daniel, tell me one kind of sending unit, just one. Fuel. What? No, I mean type of sending unit, not, you know, fuel, coolant, wool, or whatever. One type of one type of sending unit. I'm talking, we're talking technical stuff here. One type of unit. What's, what is one type that we use? Huh? Well, they're all variable resistor according to the other earlier question. But we got you got three different kinds. Now they're they're all going to change resistance. Okay. What did we say earlier that the fuel gauge was? Fuel sending unit was. Remember? What? What'd you say? No, not for the fuel gauge, Dodo. Look at that. When I stop spoon feeding you the answer, everybody goes brain dead. Duh. We just sit here a while, maybe you'll get us an answer. We've been talking about this enough, we ought to be able to come up with three. Give me one. Just one. I'm just asking for one. One. One type. There's three different types. What do we use to measure temperature, Daniel? Oh, wow. Imagine that. Okay. What's the other one? What's another one? No, you're talking about a gauge, not a sensor, right? Now, what would you say a minute ago? Huh. Piezo resistive. That's right. That's actually the one we use as measuring pressure. Okay, now the third one, what is it? What's the fuel gauge? We've already got one that measures temperature. We've got one that measures pressure. What is it? It's a mechanical variable resistor. I said that. Yeah. Well, you were right then. See? Give, give that girl a gold star. Sorry I missed that. Anyway. I was all caught up in the moment. All right. Does everybody know? Does everybody know something now that they didn't know when they came in here? What did you learn? What did you learn from this that you didn't know when you came in here? What do you know now that you didn't know when you walked in here this morning? Anybody? The three kinds of sending units. The three kinds of sending units. That's the most recent question we got. Whatever. All right. Hey, we're working hard at this.